continue on through Esther, and uh, because it is just a fabulous, fabulous story that God has given us. Remember what I had asked you last week, because this week I think you will start to see some of the 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 the, the finger of God moving throughout this story. So. If that catches you, if you think so, I'd like for you to, to comment about that. What we, uh, what we made our way through last week, Esther chapter 1, we had King Ahasuerus, and he was throwing this six-month-long banquet. And then he finished that off with one week of solid, real <laughs> indulging. And y'all recall... He asked for Queen Vashti to come forth and display her beauty, and she refused. And when people of power make decisions like that, still today, there are consequences for the rest of us. And uh, his noblemen advised, you can't let this, you just can't let this pass. So Queen Vashti was set aside. She's, you're, yes, because when you're dealing in these type of powerful uh, monarchies, empires, you're, you can get into that type of situation real quick where things turn to life and death. Esther chapter 2, after these things, so we've had a little bit of time go by. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided. We talked a little about our marriages last week. And I'd like to just look at this situation. We all get angry. You ever get angry at me? Do we ever have constructive dialogue when we're angry back and forth? Have I ever have I ever raised my voice and you say, Oh, you're right. <laughs> and I'm putting her on the spot because I want this to be real. This is real life. That doesn't happen. Usually a day will pass. Hopefully we don't go through the whole night angry, but you go through a process when you're anger, don't you? When you're dealing with your anger. You, you kind of, you calm down, and then you, you realize, okay, maybe I didn't handle that right. And you work your way through that. And Ahasuerus is working his way through. His anger subsided. And now he's feeling a little lonely. <laughs> you know? You wake up and there's nobody there next to you. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So he's, he's definitely thinking things through. He's now, things have settled and he's trying to process, well, I've, I've, I've made some decisions, and what, what do we know about the laws of the Medes and the Persians? It's final. It's final. There's no amending. There's no repealing a law in this kingdom. Ever. Then the king's attendants who served him. Now, never forget, this, this is where a lot of power lies. <coughs> These are attendants... They know his personality. They know what he's feeling. They see his sadness, his happiness. His, his attendants who served him, they thinking amongst themselves, he's, he's not happy. And when the king's not happy, nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. They said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom. That's 127 provinces. There's a lot of ladies. 
Let all the provinces of his kingdom be searched that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to the harem. And I think Ahasuerus said, that's a good idea. Right there. I, I, can, I can go along with that. Here in the harem, they will be into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Now there was at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now Mordecai had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Okay, I'll be the first to say, I think now we're starting to see some providence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's Mordecai, who just happens to be in a situation that's near the capital of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, right? Now, he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther his uncle's daughter for she had no father or mother so Esther was orphaned it's quite responsible of an uncle isn't it I don't know if I would be comfortable with Uncle Mark <laughs> being responsible for your upbringing <laughs> Well, you Uncle Mike, yes. Uncle Mark, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there was no choice. But there was right. maybe no choice. And then but I would tell you that this is what family does, isn't mm -hmm. it? There was no home to send Esther to. This is family stepping in as the law would have them do and take care as God would have them do. Now let's learn a little about Esther. Now, she was a young lady. She was beautiful of form and face. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. That's a lot of sacrifice to take someone as your own child. But this is, this is the type of man he is. So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai that Esther was taken to the king's palace and to the custody of Haggai who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him. So he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Remind you of Daniel? Remind you of Daniel? Where you have someone who is upright, young, has integrity, has some smarts about them, we'll, we'll mentor that. And that guy, he's willing to step into this situation. He's judging. He wants to do a good job for Ahasuerus. And so the, he wants the king to have the best. We need to be friendly. Don't underestimate being sweet, smiling, being kind. It's easy to be acidic. You may feel that you're protecting yourself by being walled off. 
That's not how Esther handles this. She's raised by a man who's kind. She sees that. She embraces that. And others see Esther. Not only was she beautiful of face and form, but she was beautiful where else? In her heart. In her heart. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day, every day, Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. Concerned. Yep, Good concerned. Good Using his modern day, not modern day, is equivalent to Instagram. <laughs> he's keeping track. He's watching. He's listening. He's asking questions. Now, when the turn of each young lady came to go into King Ahasuerus, after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows, they spent six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and the cosmetics for women. Jeez. Who said geez? <laughs> That's something, isn't it? Well, she was pretty and it had good form and it right? still took all this time. And she had all the yes. Estee Lauder she could want. <laughs> this was a spa and a half. Yeah. <laughs> this is a spa and a half. Yeah. A, a whole year just getting dolled up. I don't want to make light of that. I mean, this is this is a time for them to probably learn all the uh, etiquette that they needed to learn. You, you had to behave a very particular way when you're in these realms of power. So the young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. Uh, I think of gladiators, right? You get to choose your weapon of choice as you go in to do battle. These young ladies, these young ladies were allowed to take whatever they, they deemed was necessary. They may be good at the violin. They may play the bells. They may be good at art, but they got to take with them something that would please the king. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. So you weren't just free to drop in on the king. You had to be summoned. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, when, that came, when her time came to go in to the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. She listens. She listens. She listens. She knows that she doesn't know everything. And that's a big step towards wisdom, recognizing that you know enough to know that you don't know what you're talking about. And Esther was able to listen to the proper people to those who had the knowledge, to those who had the wisdom. That's who she's listening to. Nobody knows more than Haggai. He's in charge of this whole operation. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year, of his reign. Did it work? Uh -huh. Did it work for her? The king loved Esther. 
He loved her more than all the women. She found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Any providence? Or you think she's doing all this on her own? Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. <laughs> he also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's <laughs> bounty. Not only would that uh, engender favor with the king, but with all the provinces. I mean, everyone's got a tax-free day, maybe, for Esther's day. And we love tax-free day, don't we? Isn't that before school? You get that tax-free day? School, tax-free day, and a hurricane. Hurricane. When they, re when they t roll back the tolls on the expressway, you just feel like, you know what? You're getting something. Thank you, DeSantis. Yeah. <laughs> Esther had not yet made known. Oh, wait. Did I? 19. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Still checking up on her. Still checking up. I, and, and tell me that Mordecai just happens to decide on this day to be sitting at the gate at this particular time. Be looking for that, be looking for that providence, guys. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her, as she had done when under his care. So even when she was past 18, she did. <laughs> I love having my daughters here. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thion and Teresh Two of the king's officials, from those who guarded the door, they became angry and they sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. What does that mean to lay hands on the king here? Would have heard. You better kill him. You better kill him. If you're going to strike at the godfather, you better take him out. If you don't. <clears throat> But the plot became known to Mordecai. Why? He was sitting at the king's Because he was sitting at the gate. Listening in. And he's got his ear to the ground, right? And so Mordecai told Queen Esther. And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. She's willing to give credit where credit is due, isn't she? And she's willing to trust. You have to trust that Mordecai's got this right. I mean, it's his reputation that she puts faith in because this is not going to go well for Big Fan, right? Now, when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. You know, we put everything in Facebook. When you were young, you may have put everything in a diary. The king does the same thing. <clears throat> everything is recorded. Everything is written down. Everything is there to be referenced to at a later time, isn't it? Ah, a chapter. <laughs> you know, yes. I think about because we have three young ladies here. We have Emma and Morgan and Addie, who are probably about the age that Esther was. That's and true. you think about taking those from their parents. That's true. 
and what Jason would do and what Carl would do to make sure his his daughters are being taken care of, that they're not being hurt, that they're not being abused. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what goes on the other side of the gate, you have no control no, you over. Have no do you? idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was Mordecai her uncle? Uh -huh. We've always uh, said, said that. that. Now, uh, her dad was Mordecai's uncle. Okay, so does yeah. that mean they're cousins? Cousins. They're cousins. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. what I thought too. Now, that may not be a term used. I don't that that uh, Stephanie that, that mean, term ever used in the Old Testament. I cousins. Don't, I don't remember cousins. The word cousin I don't words. think so. No, usually it's like it would be the father's brother's son. Or right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. cousins may if you had an older cousin, he may be referred to as an uncle also. Mm -hmm. Just like grandfathers are sometimes called the father, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it could be the great great grandchild, but this is their father. You're right. But also also too in that time frame you still had quite a few that were what we would consider really, really old. Not, uh -huh. not Methuselah old, but really, really old. Really, really old. So even though Mordecai might have been a cousin, he might have been 10. Much older. 10, right, 10, right, 10, right, 10 right, 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 right. Because he came, it is specified that he was part of, he lived in, in Israel. He lived in Jerusalem. He was exiled out. Right. Uh, it's Esther was born much, 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 much later. All right, chapter three. I, okay. <laughs> After these events, so we've had a coup. It was failed. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman. No booing. It's coming. It'll no be coming. booing. It'll be coming. Uh, uh, one of the traditions when during I'm going to mispronounce it. I'm just Purim. Purim. <laughs> they read the Book of Esther every time and whenever you say the word Haman the crowd is supposed to go bah, 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 bah. Uh, not him. Not him. so bah humbug but you know here we have the king we see the king make good decisions and bad decisions don't we we see we see that throughout his life he's he's human like the rest and he thinks Haman's a pretty good guy. He promotes Haman, the son Hamadetha, the Agite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. So he's up there. He's, you know, he's got, got a good bit of power. He's full of himself, too. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate, they bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Uh -oh. <laughs> then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him, and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman, You know, I always remembered this story that Haman noticed that Mordecai would not bow down. Well, he does. But this, well, he does now that he's been told. Right. And now that he's looking, but we're dealing now with tattletales. Mm -hmm. These guys tattled on Mordecai. Haman had no idea. Mordecai wasn't on his radar. But they pointed it out to Haman. Hey, look, this Mordecai, he doesn't bow down to you. For he, Mordecai, had told them that he was a Jew. You know, he gave that advice to Esther to keep that close to the vest. But he didn't. That was the truth. Or he may have been. Or he may have said, I think that guy's a jerk. I'm not going to bow down to a jerk who's <laughs> full of himself. <laughs> Both of those things were true. Because I have no doubt that if Mordecai was brought into King Ahasuerus' presence, he would bow. There's something more here to that between Mordecai and Haman. And we're getting there. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with 
rage. What pride. What pride. Did this really affect Haman's power in any way? Oh, not at this time. No. No. What, what Mordecai did meant nothing to Haman as far as the decisions he made, his yearly income, where he lived, had no effect on him. But boy, it was all ruined by one man who would not bow. He disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. This is how evil he is. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. He's not going to just be happy killing Mordecai. I'm probably going to get this wrong. I think it was Lenin said, to kill one man is a tragedy. To kill a million is a statistic. Yeah, that's how these genocides have been viewed throughout history. And that's what Haman is seeking here. He doesn't want to make a martyr out of Mordecai. He wants to de destroy the whole Jewish nation. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't help but think uh, this book is relevant today. <laughs> We're talking the same things in the news today, aren't we? He wants to destroy all the people of Mordecai who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month, until the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. Now he's timing this. He's, he's put up with Mordecai not bowing for a, a good period of time. Time's right, and he knows to strike. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, <clears throat> You know, King, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples already trying to supplant ideas in the king's mind because you got people who don't quite assimilate they don't belong they're scattered throughout you don't know who they are or where they are king they're dispersed all over your provinces their laws are different from those of all other people and they do not observe the king's law so it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I don't want this to cost you a lot of money, king. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put it into the king's treasuries. I mean, this is smart. Haman's smart. A lot of evil people are really, really smart. He doesn't bring up the nation, does he? He never once mentions exactly who he's talking about. He just leaves it vague and general. There's a people out there. You can't trust them, and we need to get rid of them, and I'm going to pay a lot of money into your treasury. Well, then the king took his signet <laughs> ring from his hand and he gave it to Haman. What do we do with a signet ring? It's like wax. So this is where the authority is, isn't it? And that ring is authority. And so Ahasuerus is saying, here's my ring. You have my authority. You can do it in my name. You can make the law that you're wanting to make with my name, my authority, my ring. And what do we know about the laws of the Medes and the Persians? You ain't changing it. The son of Hamadath the Agai, 
the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, The silver is yours, and the people also. Do with them as you please. He didn't investigate this. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and it was written, just as Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province and to the princes of each people. Each province according to its script, each according to its language, being written in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed with the king's signet ring, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. You want something done, put a financial incentive with it. It'll get done. It'll get done. This is, this is pretty horrendous for the Jews. And they're making sure everybody knows they had chat GPT, it was translating it into every language for every person to know what was to happen on that 13th day. <clears throat> A copy of the edict to be issued as law in every province was published to all the peoples so that they should be ready for this day. The couriers went out impelled by the king's command while the decree was issued at the citadel in Susa. And while the king and Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was in confusion. At the end of every good business deal, somebody's having a drink. Man, two chapters. <laughs> All right, so we're starting to see some problems. We're starting to see some things move around Still haven't heard God's name, though, have we? Right? All right. All right, guys. But you can see his hand. You can see his hand. Well, we are at our 11 o'clock. And, uh, and this was a good time together. So if you guys are willing to listen, I'm willing. I think we just keep rolling through, Esther. We'll be gone for two weeks. Uh, and when we come back, we'll pick up. At She'll wait on you. <laughs> She's a, she is a good woman. She's a good woman. Uh, Jim, will you lead us in a closing prayer when it's the time?